All right, next up, we have a session called Words and Numbers. Please welcome to the stage Anthony Davies and James Harrigan. Thank you. This week, we're going to be talking about freedom, obviously, why we're here, why you're all here. And I've got a simple question to start us off. I'm just going to ask you to do a thought experiment. Just think about the question for a minute and how you might answer it. And notice that I'm not asking, how free are you? I'm asking, how are you free? And the, the phrasing of that question makes a big difference. So how are you free, exactly? I can't ask each of you, but I can answer in my own terms. Right? So a couple of days ago, not the time that I'm here, but a couple of days ago, I woke up at my house in what I think of as regular time. And I, I woke up, and the first thing I did, of course, I, I walked into the bathroom, splashed a little bit of water onto my face, and I realized that my regulated life was already in action. Right? That The water coming into my house, highly regulated. And the fact that I live in Tucson, Arizona, a desert, makes it even more so. And I push the thought away, and I kind of make my way to the, to the kitchen where I turn the coffee maker on. And, well, the, the maker itself was regulated as as was the coffee. And you're starting to see a theme emerge here, right? Because then my wife and a couple of my children walked in and I realized my wife was regulated. She had to be of a certain age before I could marry her. I'm not saying it's a bad thing necessarily, but she was regulated. And those children are unbelievably regulated. Right? God help me if I ever, you know, beat them uh, where there are rules. All right, so maybe it's interpersonal things, but then I walked out and got in my car, which is the most regulated thing any of you will ever own unless you happen to own an airplane. I drove on regulated roads. I went to a regulated job. And before you know it, I'm sitting back and I can't name a single thing that I did in the space of an average day that wasn't completely regulated. How free... Am I? Well, how am I free is the better answer, because it, it seems like I'm not free at all. And you can see some metrics for this, the Code of Federal Regulations, which embodies all the regulations to which we are subject. When it was first published was a couple thousand pages. It's now close to 200,000 pages. These are all regulations that hit us. Probably the, the one set of regulations that impacts us the most is the tax code. The tax code is so large that no one, not the people who wrote it, not the people who administer it, not the people who even publish it, know how many pages it is. This is the sort of regulation we're subject to day in, day out. And yet, oddly, you would think that this is a recipe for stasis. How can any of us do anything if we're subject to that level of regulation? And yet, life kind of goes on, right? We all have a sense of what's the right thing to do and what's the not right thing to do. And you notice something interesting, that there's this undercurrent of spontaneous order. We understand how, it, how we should behave with others, and others understand how they should behave with us. And we tend not to have to consult the regulations, except once in a while, like on April 15th, or if you're going to buy a new coffee maker or something of that nature. But generally speaking, People get people conduct business with each other via spontaneous order. If I can just jump in for a second, there are a couple of things that we can point to to make you see that the, the regulation, Federal Register, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the first one that I like to think about is that if, if you're in San Francisco with a pet dog in a public park, the way you must clean up its mess is specified in the federal record, the federal register. Also, if you decide you want to build a spacecraft and fly it into space, all the rules for that are also specified. So from the, the tiniest, most ridiculous thing to the most massive undertaking that human beings do, you're kind of screwed no matter where you go. And it's, it's interesting, because you're right, we do kind of know what we're supposed to do in broad terms. Right? It's, it's when we drill down that it gets so difficult. But broadly speaking, most of us go about our business never even thinking about this sort of thing. And we're talking here simply about federal regulations. Of course, there's state and local regulations that go on top of all of this. But what's 
interesting is to step back and think about how our federal government was designed. The things that it is allowed to do, number maybe eight, and they're listed there in black and white in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. These are the things the federal government is allowed to do. It's not allowed to do anything else. And what's happened is we've broken through three barriers, we, the federal government. The first barrier was the voters, where, look, if the federal government starts doing things it shouldn't be doing, what do you do? You vote the guys out. Yeah, except we didn't. Because we and they, the politicians, discovered that they can buy us out. Now, it's illegal to buy somebody's vote unless you're using taxpayer money to do it. So I can say to all of you, elect me, and I will take their money and give it to you. And lo and behold, you elect me. And then the next election cycle, I say to you people, elect me, and I'll take money from them and give it to you. And you elect me. And I do that. I just keep doing that over and over again. And, and what happens is this, the barrier of voters breaks down. And then you've got another barrier, barrier, which is the Constitution. And we rely on the Supreme Court to hold the federal government within the bounds of the Constitution. It stopped doing that at the dawn of the progressive era. And so what you get is a Supreme Court that, gives, that does backflips to argue why the federal government should do the sorts of things it should do. And then finally, the last barrier that would hold back the federal government is sound money, something like a gold standard that prevents the federal government from printing as much money as it wants. And we blew the doors off of that, starting back in the 1940s and ending in 1970. And so what have we done? We have unleashed this federal government, it's broken through all three of these barriers, and the consequence is what we talk about every election cycle. A this time, a $28 trillion debt. That's the numeric value of a federal government that has grown beyond its bounds. Uh, it, it's interesting, too, because Ant and I and probably all of you sat around and watched all the Democratic debates as we, we made our way to uh, Election Day. And not once, literally not once in any of the debates, all the people who were, were speaking, not one of them even used the word debt. It never came up. And when you look at things that are as bad as they now are, and surely we're over 30 trillion now, um, I can barely keep track of how fast it accrues. When you realize that we're in this much trouble, every politician will run away from the word, which should be all the evidence you need to understand that they will not fix this. They, they don't want to, they don't have any interest in it, they will not do it. They didn't talk about the federal debt at all. And we're talking about, we watched this carefully from the primaries all the way through to the debates between Biden and Trump, nobody talks about the debt, right? Probably the largest problem, chronic problem facing the federal government. None of them talked about the impending insolvency of Social Security. And yet the Social Security Administration itself tells us that Social Security will be insolvent within the next 10 to 15 years. Not a word, not a peep. Why? Because all of us, from the politicians down to the voters, have become addicted to unlimited federal government. And so the thing grows. And how is it we can become addicted? We justify it. We say things like, we want to do something to, and then fill in the blank. I'll give you one fill in the blank. We want to do something to help the poor. And so we create, to date, over 100 federal programs aimed at helping the poor. And I don't mean 100 sequentially, like this one didn't work, so let's try something else. I mean 100 existing simultaneously. 100 federal programs designed to help the poor. I took the, the opportunity when Ant and I wrote a book, it's called Cooperation and Coercion. Um, I listed each one of those things individually and it took about what, four pages Yeah, of, of the book. It's the most boring four pages you'll ever see. I can't believe the editor let me get away with it, but it's a four page list. It's like, the, it's the fourth longest run on sentence in the English language. <laughs> That might be right, actually. And all I can see when I look at it is failure. And it's the willful kind of failure that you, you really can't have any patience with, right? These are people who do something every three months and it doesn't work. Sooner or later, you would think that this type of human being would say, well, this isn't working. Let's try something else. But honestly, that's how they make their living. And human beings have this habit of letting things run well past their, their timeline, and I give you the March of Dimes is the perfect example. 
right? It was to give a dime to, to discover a cure for polio. Well, uh, polio was cured. The March of Dimes lives on. The uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, another great example. They got a universal 0.08% uh, limit on a breathalyzer, and they still exist. Why? I don't know. They got exactly what they said they were going to get. It would seem time for them to, to disappear, but that's not how human beings do their, do their business. Yeah, and this is predictable. This is a public choice outcome. That's what the economists would call it. In other words, there are incentives in place to keep these programs running. In fact, I would go a step further and say that there are incentives in place not to solve the problem. Because so long as the problem, whatever it is, drunk drivers or poverty or whatever, as long as the problem persists, politicians can use it at the next election cycle and say, elect me. My opponent couldn't solve this problem, but I can. I have a plan. And four years later, I haven't solved the, solved the problem. He comes along and says, elect me, and I'll solve the problem. And we keep on falling for this every four years. And so you end up with as we have now, over 100 programs aimed at helping the poor, add up the numbers. We have spent, since we started our war on poverty in 1967, adjusted for inflation, we have spent $24 trillion fighting poverty. And what have we gotten for it? If you look at the poverty rate in this country going back to 1967 up to the present, sometimes it's a little higher, sometimes a little, it's a little lower, but it fluctuates around 13%. 13% plus or minus 2 or 3%. It's pretty constant. And so a critic would point to that and say, $24 trillion? And that's all you could do? Hold poverty at 13%? To which the politician responds, yeah, but imagine how bad the problem would be if we hadn't spent that $24 trillion. That's hard to argue with until you do something kind of common sense. You ask a question, what else could we have done with that $24 trillion? Well, it turns out for $24 trillion, we could have cut a check to every poor person, not every poor family, every poor person in the United States, cut a check every year for $10,000. So a family of three, mother, father, kid, they would receive every year a check for $30,000. That would have eliminated poverty. For the same $24 trillion, we could have lived the past 60 years with a 0% poverty rate. Instead, we have this constant 13. Why? Because of all of the elections that are won, because of all of the federal jobs that are involved, because the welfare system has become a mechanism that uses the poor as an input to create jobs for the middle class. Oh, and wins elections for politicians. And, and honestly, we have to think about the other two wars on nouns that the United States is engaged in. And, and the first one is the war on uh, drugs, followed by the war on terror. And what you find is that these things end up working exactly the same way as the war on poverty did, right? So year after year after year, you just spend all this money. And we actually took all three of these wars against nouns and added the outlays, the expenditures together, and they cost $23 trillion. 28, as much as the federal debt. So the federal yeah. debt that we have year in, year out, is perfectly explained by these three programs, or, or these three, these three thousands wars. of programs. Right, yeah. And what ends up happening, I want to underline this, we do fall for this hook, line, and sinker every four years, right? We get a batch of candidates who will say, just elect me and I'm going to solve poverty, the drug problem. They give the big long list and like a bunch of fools, we go and vote for them and they, they take office. And four years later, somebody else comes along with exactly the same argument. And this has been the case every four years, my entire life. I don't know about older people's lives, but I can tell you about mine. And when you ask why you keep falling for it, they just answer in hyperpartisan terms. Yeah, it, I, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's even worse than what you're describing, because if my party is in power, whatever money is being spent is being spent well, and I'm happy with it. 
whenever your party's in power, now it's a problem, even though your party is doing the exact same thing that my party did. And so neither one of us becomes focused on the problem. We just become focused on rooting for our team, whichever it is. I mean, does any rational person really think there's a lot of difference between the Biden administration and the Trump administration it replaced? I can't. Oh, I think a lot of people think there's a difference. They do, but is there a difference? And I'll be damned, I can't see it. It's not that I'm not looking. And I suspect we will see a difference when it comes time to nominate Supreme Court justices. But apart from that, I'm not so sure I know. I hear about the border problem that we're having in the Biden administration. And it sounds like exactly the same things the Trump administration did, but they were evil then and now they're not. But they're the same damn things. So I, I don't even know what to say about it. When, when you really sit back and take a look, there's just never any real difference. I want to shift gears and go back to where we started, where you asked how free are we. And all of the arguments we've been making seem to point toward government as a problem that if we just got rid of it, things would be better. And before you go there, I think there's an important question that we need to ask that I don't think we ever do. And that is, what do we owe each other? We're members of a shared society. Do we owe each other something? And I think there are two things I can say for certain. One is, whatever it is we might owe each other, it's not 100%. And I think I can also say, whatever it is we owe each other, it isn't zero. We are members of a shared society. We have obligations to each other as human beings. Now, I think there's a limit on what that is. There are a lot of people who think that the limit is way higher than what I do. But there are some people who think it's a lot lower. But that question, and I don't know how you get an answer, but I think that's the question we need to be asking. What do we owe each other? There are probably anarchists within the sound of your voice that want to kill you right now. Yeah, probably. And that's, that's fine. But I actually agree. Um, and I agree for good reasons over a very long period of human experience. All the way back to Aristotle, you are going to hear about how men are social animals. We must live together because it's in our nature to do so. And if you think about that, that's exactly right. If it weren't right, we would all know hermits that only came out of the mountains to get food and go back and you think these are, and we don't, right? So yeah. And then when, by the time Thomas Jefferson writes the Declaration of Independence, it's, it's funny actually, because what he says is that government exists to secure your rights, that's all. It exists because of the consent of the governed, that's all. And whenever it fails to secure your safety and happiness, it's your right to alter or abolish it and replace it with another government. Jefferson says you can wash away a government as, as often as you might want, but you can't replace it with nothing, that there's going to be another government. And I think that's a, a tacit admission that that's just what's going to happen whether you want it to or not. Yeah, and let me throw a bone to the anarchists amongst us. You, you are near and dear to my heart. I think anarchi anarchism is a wonderful idea. I think it's I think it requires a level of maturity that the human race hasn't achieved yet. But as an economist, I have to notice something. And that is, every time humans come together, we form government. Never has there been a society of humans that hasn't evolved some form of government. And so, if I take spontaneous order seriously, I have to kind of admit that government itself is a product of spontaneous order. That tells me, at least from an empirical standpoint, if not from a philosophical standpoint, that maybe we do owe each other something. And that's the heart of the political question, right? I mean, how much? And when you ask people, it's, it's kind of funny, because Ant and I have been straw polling people for at least the last 10 years now, and they almost all say exactly the same thing, which is very curious. They say, I think it's about 20%. They always do this. Um, some say zero. Some say zero. Some say 100. Well, some don't say 100, but they say like 85 or some idiotic number like that. But this, this interesting bit in the middle, this 20%, it's telling because people are willing to understand that they do owe something, and it's roughly 20% of everything they earn in one year, and then we'll see what happens next year. And I, I would submit that this is, if we could capitalize on it in some way, 
the way out of the governmental morass that we now have. Because if we could actually write a tax code, we would start with 20%, because that's what most people are only too happy to, to concede. And once you say, okay, we're gonna tax everybody, literally everybody at, at 20%, maybe put in an exemption for the very poor, um, now you can approach spending in a completely different way. You can say, we've got this much money. What are our priorities? And how do they fall in list form? And you could just go through until you run out of money, and then anything below the line just doesn't get done. Yeah, and, and notice how that differs markedly from the way we do things now. And you'll hear politicians talking about this even now. You turn on the news tonight, you'll hear them saying things like, well, there's this program, and we need, you know, to make housing more affordable or healthcare more affordable or college more affordable, whatever it is. And to achieve this end, we need to raise taxes. Notice the calculus that goes on in the head. It's, it's always, we want this, therefore we should take more. Never is it, we want this and therefore we need to take less of that. There's no trade-off, the same kind of trade-off you would make in your household of, you know, you want Netflix and Amazon Prime, you're going to have to give something up. That thought process never goes through the heads of politicians. It's never giving something up. It's always taking something more. And so this suggests that, I'm going to be bold here, that our founders may have made a fundamental error in not writing down that the federal government may take X percent of the economy and no more, period. And so consequently, we're in this state now where the federal government just takes as much as it wants. I want to give the, the founders a little bit of credit here. They did write a constitution that had, a, had the income tax as unconstitutional. Right? This was a mistake that we all made later on when we, when we ratified an amendment that gave us this monstrous tax. And honestly, if you ask me what percentage of tax I pay, I don't know. I never know. I know that they take some out of paychecks. They don't take some out of the other sorts of work I do. And then on one miserable day, my, my, my accountant comes and says, okay, write a check for this much. I know one day a year what I'm paying. And I, I dare say that's how it's designed. If you really wanted the tax, the tax regime that we have, if you wanted it to operate on honorable principles, you wouldn't have withholding. You would, at the end of every year, send somebody a note saying, you owe this much. And I know the IRS can do this because whenever I make a mistake, they send me a letter saying, you made a mistake. They already knew how much I needed to pay them. They just made me go to an accountant anyway. And as long as that's true, you know that there are nefarious purposes going on here. This is not right. And if we had to have people cut a check at the end of every year, they wouldn't be able to because they would have spent the money that they earned thinking fantastically that it was theirs to spend. Yeah, so there, there are two things to think about here. One is, is this idea of withholding. And I read somewhere that this, I, I would be cautious saying this because I can't recall where I read it, but I read somewhere that this was Milton Friedman's idea early on, that income taxes be withheld from the paycheck so you don't notice it. And there's an interesting psychological phenomenon. If we all had to write a check to the federal government on April 15th, we would have a much, much smaller federal government than we have. But we don't notice the money is taken out because it's taken out and we never see it. So that's item number one. Item number two, we talk a lot about simplicity. Politicians will talk about simplifying the tax code. Nobody actually wants to simplify it because the more complex it is, the easier it is to hide what they're doing. So I'll say, look, you all elect me and I'll give you a special tax break and I'll give you a special deduction. I'll give you special something else. And this gets written into tax code. And before you know it, the thing becomes incredibly complex. Why? Because I bought off people. I bought off voters by promising that I would give some of your money to them. It's, it's a lot like what the Oprah Winfrey show sounds like. You get an exemption, you get an exemption. But there was a guy a while back, his name was Phil Graham from Texas, U.S. Senator, and he came out, this would have been in the 90s, he came out and said, I have your new tax form. It's a postcard. Yeah, and, Forbes did this. Too. And yeah. all, all, it, all it required was um, the, the amount you made, the percentage you taxed, the amount you, you, you taxed, the amount, the amount you send back in. And that thing was dead before the ink was even dry on it.
it was so perfectly simple that children understood it. And that's exactly why we can't have it. I want to um, point your attention to, I'll pick on Elizabeth Warren, because she's not the only one, uh, talking about a wealth tax. And the rhetoric that she and others will use is this wealth tax is only on billionaires. You all don't have to worry about it. And of course, we all cheer and say, yeah, well, it's tax billionaires. They can afford the money. 3%. 3%. Anybody know how much Elizabeth Warren's worth, by the way? $12 million. Now, she hasn't suggested that she be taxed 12, 3%. It's the billionaires. But nonetheless, listen to that rhetoric. The tax doesn't apply to you. It applies to the super rich. We've heard that argument before. Well, in fairness, nobody in this room heard that before. We but, heard but this we argument. As people did hear it before. Yeah, we heard it at, when the federal income tax was being debated as a constitutional amendment. And politicians arguing for a federal income tax back then said, look, this income tax, it's only going to apply to the rich. In fact, there was one politician who in these debates got up and said publicly, look, this is only going to apply to the rich and this is what you claim and you're claiming it's going to be 1%. That might sound familiar too. He said, before you know it, this tax will rise to, and he named a number. And people laughed at him. They said, that's ridiculous. There's no way the federal government would ever tax people that much. The number he named, 5%. Today, the poorest Americans are taxed at double that rate. So this is a warning when you hear politicians saying something like, well, it's a wealth tax, it only applies to the billionaires. Getting a new tax passed is a very heavy lift. Once that tax is established, ratcheting down the cutoff for it is very easy. So in the case of the federal income tax, this was passed in circa 1913, early 1900s. It was passed, top marginal tax rate I think was 2%. It applied to the very rich. It took seven years, seven years for Congress to quadruple the income tax rate and to extend it all the way down to the poor. Within less than a decade, Congress was imposing this income tax that they promised was only for the rich. They were imposing it on people who earned, in today's dollars, under 15000 That was the tax on the rich. And it, it, it gets worse, right? You realize when you think about these things that tax dollars kind of like heroin or crack to the politician, right? They just, once they start getting it, they can't stop getting it. And I remember when I was young, I lived in Connecticut where I was born and raised, and Connecticut had a, a, a very high sales tax. It was about 7%. But we didn't have any income tax, so okay. And by the time I was a teenager, they started talking about how we needed an income tax. But they said, look, we can raise so much with an income tax that we can back way off on the sales tax. And the income tax passed. It, it was never in any doubt that it was not going to pass. And what happened to the sales tax? It stayed exactly the same. It was never repealed. And, and there you go, right? The minute the new tax gets on the rolls, we don't live in a world in which a tax disappears. And notice something interesting that happens. James is talking about state taxes. There's a fascinating dynamic that occurs at the state level that does not occur at the federal level. And that is the states have to compete amongst each other. In a very similar way, the businesses have to compete. If Amazon is going to charge you less than eBay, people are going to leave e eBay and go to Amazon. So too with the states. If you've got a state that is taxing more and not offering enough in return, people will leave as they're currently leaving Connecticut, as they're currently leaving California. And there's a natural mechanism built in that's going to force these states to compete. That mechanism doesn't exist at the federal level. I mean, people will say, well, sure, if you don't like it, leave. A, that's really expensive. Where the hell am B, I supposed to go? Well, B, you need the government's permission to leave. It's interesting when you look at the states, though, this ability of, of exit. Um, and you look at all the New England states, and those the people there are moving south and in very, very clear patterns. Um, and you go out to California, and, and those people, the ones who leave, 
and they're leaving in droves are coming to my state of Arizona. And they're kind of pissing everybody in Arizona off because they, they leave California because of the taxes. And then they come to Arizona and agitate for the same programs that caused all the, all the problems in the first place. So there's no real easy answer here. But we do see negative growth in some states. California, New Jersey, I believe, maybe even New York at this point. Um, and in the other ones, you get significant outflows, even though you don't get negative, uh, negative rates. Yeah, and something else interesting happens. California is a good example of this. As the state starts, starts building not just higher taxes, but more progressive taxes, its tax revenue becomes unstable. California's income tax is so progressive that if they have a downturn and several, you know, a handful of their multi-billionaires have now lost money, all of a sudden there's a significant reduction in tax revenue. Or if a bunch of billionaires decide I've had enough, I'm leaving, all of a sudden there's a significant reduction in revenue. They have, it's as if you took your retirement portfolio and put it all in Bitcoin. There's no diversification amongst the population. And and this this really looks ridiculous by the end, doesn't it? Because what you find is that really state taxes three or four people can shift the entirety of the problem yeah with a very progressive tax yeah yeah and and I, i'll tell you i lived in california for a while i was there for about four or five years and i had to fill out my taxes and i was at a total loss i had no idea what it was what the forms even meant right and that's how complicated tax systems have gotten so on the one hand i couldn't figure out the california taxes not to the point where I thought I might not get arrested, and I couldn't figure out the federal taxes. I just had to hire people to do it. And that's exactly why Phil Graham's um, postcard is never going to work, because it's going to put an entire class of people, accountants, out of business. Oh, the accountants, the lawyers, the estate planners. Yeah. Yeah, so, there's a whole constituency of people who now rely on the complexity of the tax code to earn a living. Right. And, and we write all the time that politicians purposefully make the tax code more complex than it ever had to be. And of course they do. Why wouldn't they? That's how they keep you on the hook. There's no way to get around it. So where does all this take us? So we start with asking how free are you? And the answer is, well, not terribly in, so. In some sense, not terribly. And this comes about because these three barriers we put on the federal government have been broken down. The voters, the Constitution, and, and sound money. And so you get a runaway federal government. You get this debt that we have. We had our first trillion dollar deficit under Obama. And very quickly, voters became comfortable with trillion dollar deficits. It didn't take long before we had our first two trillion dollar deficit. And then three. And I would imagine that moving forward, I would be surprised if our deficit is only one trillion dollars going into the future. Well, welcome into the party, the MMT people. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that brings us to an interesting conclusion, and that is, I claim, politicians are aware that they have run out of places to raise money. They've taxed the rich about as much as you can do. And if you want to put it in perspective, forget about taxing the, rich, the billionaires 3%, tax them 100%. Well, take all their wealth. Take their entire wealth, not their income, take their wealth, everything they have from all the billionaires in the U.S., and you'll raise enough money to fund the federal government for eight months. And, oh, and then you have no billionaires. This is the magnitude of the spending. Politicians have realized that they can't go back to that well anymore. There's not much to be raised. And I give you as evidence, if you look historically at the top marginal income tax rate, so it's some places back in the 1950s, it was high as like 92%. In the Reagan years, it comes down to like 27 or something. It goes up in the Clinton years, right? So it's up and down from the 1950s to the present. Top marginal income tax rate. If you then ask, what fraction of the economy did the federal government collect in tax revenue? It's a pretty constant 18%. Doesn't matter whether we tax the rich a lot or a little. In fact, it doesn't matter whether you tax capital gains or income. The total amount of money the federal government collects is about 18% of the economy. That's all they get. So what politicians are doing now, I claim, is they're looking for a new source of tax revenue. And that new source of tax revenue is a group of people who collectively earn twice what the 1% earn. 
and are currently taxed at one half the rate that the 1% are taxed. That's the middle and upper classes. That's who the politicians have their eyes on. And if you read Joe Biden's proposed tax plan, and I'm not arguing for or against specific legislation here, I'm just saying read what's there. There's two interesting pieces. One interesting piece is that if you have assets and you die and you leave it to your kids, like a business or a farm or something, they must pay tax on that immediately. And they must pay tax even if they don't sell it. So whatever the business is worth, it's worth a million dollars, you got to pay tax on that million dollars, even if you don't sell it. The politicians are talking about this as if it's an estate tax and a state ta a death tax and a death tax on the rich. I claim that it's neither of those things. It's actually a tax on the middle class. It's a tax on middle class businesses. It's a tax on middle class farms. And if you look at the code, you'll see things like Biden saying, well, OK, but we won't apply this to farms that are worth less than a million dollars or to family businesses that are worth less than a million dollars. He's not suggesting the tax doesn't apply to them. He's suggesting that you don't have to pay it until later when you decide to sell the business. And, and notice the backflips and the cartwheels that we're willing to do to complicate the tax code. And yet, Ant's right, um, this 18% business, it holds over very long periods of our history, so much so that we wrote about it a few times, and then we did a podcast or two on it as well. And the result of those things were um, a group of congressional staffers asked if we could all have a call, and we said, sure. And we took the call, and, and the first question they asked was, how many people are working in your shop to figure this out? And, and we laughed quite a lot before we told them it was just us, really. And they said, how on earth can you make these calculations? We said, it's easy. Take GDP and multiply by 0 0.18, 0 0.18. Just do, do that every year, and you're going to come pretty damn close to exactly the right number. And you could have heard a pin drop, right? I, I don't know that they ever bothered to think it through past that. I hope they did. But it was just shocking to them that a couple of guys with the podcast could have just figured this out because we were up against the Congressional Budget Office, who routinely gets this very, very wrong. So this whole conversation isn't complete unless we talk about MMT, modern monetary theory. We don't understand it, by the way. So, <laughs> Right. Modern monetary theory, in my opinion, boils down to we're going to print money. And don't worry about inflation. It won't happen. And if you press MMTers on this, they'll say, well, but if you do get inflation, you can counteract it by taxing. So the game is we're going to print money that the government can spend. And it can spend as much as it wants. And if prices start to rise, we'll tax to siphon some of that money back out of the economy so you don't get inflation. Now, stop and think that through for a moment. What they just suggested was replacing your decision as to what goods and services should be produced with politicians' decisions as to what goods and services should be produced. So we might end up at the end of the day with the same GDP we had before, but instead of that GDP comprising things like video games and guacamole and houses, it's going to comprise things that the politicians want. Right, So like nuclear codes and border walls and tanks or whatever it is. The fact is, you might get the same amount of GDP, but what it is that we're producing is markedly different. It's no longer decided principally by us. It's decided principally by politicians and bureaucrats. Whenever I hear about MMT, I, I kind of feel like Homer Simpson when they asked him if he wanted the extended warranty. And he looked and he said, how can I lose? And, and there you go, right? This is snake oil. That, that's being sold and we'll, we'll all pay for this because whether we call it MMT or we call it something different, the debt that we owe is so colossal that it's literally impossible to pay off at this point. Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. When we talk about the debt, we both mentioned the number 28 trillion. That's the official debt. What that number ignores are promises that the government has made, promises in the form of future social security benefits, future Medicare benefits. Uh, future federal worker benefits, promises the federal government has made to current and future workers that it will not have the money to pay. We give that a special name. We call it unfunded liabilities. The official debt's $28 trillion. The unfunded liabilities, nobody's quite sure 
but the estimates range from, oh my God, to holy crap. Which is 100 trillion. 100 and trillion, trillion to 200 trillion. And if, if your delta is 100 trillion, there's probably a problem. Yeah, the, uns the number so large that the uncertainty is actually larger than the economic output of the planet. That's the magnitude of the unfunded liabilities. So what is the point? The point is that the government has finally bumped up against a fourth wall that we haven't discussed yet. And that fourth wall, it can't break through. And that's simply the laws of mathematics. The math just doesn't work. If the federal government were to put 100% of its tax revenues toward making good on the promises it has made to future, current and future workers, if it put 100% of its revenues toward that, it still wouldn't be able to fulfill its promises. So what are we going to do to fix this becomes the obvious question. And the only answer we can give is that we really don't know. Right? We honestly think that that is too big to repay at this point. We don't know, but we know where the answer lies. It lies down, it lies starting with the question, what do we owe each other? Well, and it's interesting too, right? Because we're gonna leave here and I'm gonna go to my regulated hotel over the regulated roads and I'm gonna go to the airport, God help us all, right? If I bring a, a thing of water past a certain point, you know, that's a big, a big incident we have to deal with. The airports are incredibly regulated. So too the airplanes that fly from one, one place to the next. So too the roads in Arizona. I can't escape it. No matter what I do day to day, I cannot escape the touch of government. And that was where we went wrong. It was when we got to that point and looked around and a bunch of us said there ought to be a law because there were a bunch of people that were only too willing to walk that road. And now we all pay for it. And I think we don't get anywhere good until people realize that they themselves have been the problem for quite some time. They're never going to want to hear it, but it's always going to be true. And that's about where we land on these things. We'll keep pointing out the problems, but until all the regular people, not the people in government, but the regular people understand what we're saying and decide to do something about it, no good is going to happen. And I don't think they'll ever come to that realization. So there we go. Thank you for your time. If you've enjoyed this, we have a weekly podcast, Words and Numbers. You can find us on all the podcast players and our book, Cooperation and Coercion, you can find on Amazon. Thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it.